We're back. It still feels weird. It's this is uh, end of January. I think I've said this before, but but as a parent, uh, the saying goes, "The days are long, but the years are short." And I think that totally applies because um, I always feel spent at the end of the day, and I have no trouble falling asleep, which is good. Put me to good use, as Charles Eisenstein says. And I enjoy everything I'm doing from the farm to podcasting to fit for service and coaching and dadding and getting to be a husband and all that shit. It's really rad. Um, love every facet of my life. So, that, But the days are long. And then <laughs> month by month, I'm like, what the fuck? We're in February? This is, this is weird. Uh, I think the whole last end of last year kind of went that way for me. So you feel that way? A little head nod to you. I feel you. I see you. Um, it is cooking right along here, you know, just thinking of the year. Uh, we really pick up stuff in March. We've got Fit for Service Academy coming out in March, with them, which I'm really stoked about. I'll talk about in a minute. But Lots of changes this year. Moving to the farm in March, same timing, February, March. Um, so many good things going on. Got some Fuji mats. Got the homies. Uh, they did free shipping, so fucking stoked for that to get the dojo all complete. I'll do a little video of that at some point, solo cast and deep dive the specifics of why I set it up the way that I did, but lots of cool shit there. Maybe a little MTV crib style. Anywho, today's podcast is with Justin Nault. Justin and I met way back in the day in the first, the first sacred hunt I did with, I didn't even know Monsel. I've heard of Monsel and my buddy, Paul Saladino, the carnivore dog had just moved here and he's like, Hey, I've got a hunt coming up. Uh, I was like, local. I just got back from Hawaii. He's like, yeah, local. I was like, I can do local. And so, um, Ended up being not an ideal hunt because of the, well, because it was a, uh, it was low fence, but it was shooting, you know, from blinds and shit, which, uh, having gone to Hawaii and, and done all the spot and stock and, you know, Molokai and, and, uh, big Island, it was like, there's no comparison. So I was like, I can't, I'm never going to do this again, but thanks for the opportunity. I realized why I was there. I was there to meet Justin Nault and I was there to, to really, you know, improve my relationship and get a lot of good time, quality time with Paul Saladino. And I was also there to meet Monsel Denton, which I've talked about in the past. But Justin, uh, I've met some great fucking people on these hunts. And that's that's the thing, you know, like not everybody. I'm like, yeah, I still call that guy. And I, I can't remember some of the names of the people I've hunted with. That said, you know, there are people I've hunted with that, are, that I became homies with that I didn't know before the hunt. And I think that's really special. You know, it is, it is really special. We find that in ceremonies too. But the sacred hunt is a ceremony. No two ways about it. Anywho, Justin and I connected while we were there on many things because Paul Saladino's crew, a lot of which of the characters that had come, were diehard carnivore guys. And while I love meat and love regenerative agriculture and love eating nose to tail and understand the benefits of all that, um, I was steadfast in my knowledge of female anatomy and the fact that this diet is clearly not for everyone. Women cannot survive on it, even though some women have great results in in getting rid of autoimmune disease and a wide variety of other ailments, carbohydrates are absolutely necessary for the female body to stay regular. What does that mean? To continue to get regular fertility cycles that show that their body is fertile and healthy. That's what that means. So Justin and I connected on that. It was a lot of guys that were diehard carnivores were having a really hard time stomaching that. And I'm like, look, it's, we're not pulling this out of our ass. There's data on this. And if you've ever trained females and put them on that diet. Good luck keeping, keeping at flow in town. It's not going to happen. Anyhow, uh, it just, it was one of those points where I, I, I could have been, fr I was frustrated at first with the amount of ignorance. And at the same time, I was like, this is really cool. Justin knows his shit. And Justin moved here two years ago, believe it or not. So remember days are long. The years are short. It felt like he just moved here. <laughs> and he's been here for two fucking years. So I reached out to him. Uh, he had done a great podcast with Sky King uh, one of my buddies, I can link to that in the show notes. It is a, a, a paid podcast through Sky King. So if you know Sky and you want to get in on that, highly recommend it. He's a good friend of mine, has been helping me with supplement sponsors for years and is a podcaster now himself. We'll link to that in the show notes. Uh, Justin did a fantastic episode there. And, um, and we touched on a little bit of that, but we also, I wanted to take it into Justin's life story and plant medicines and all the cool shit that make him the most, one of the most rounded out, awesome people I've ever met. And he's got a dope story. You know, he was on the fast track to fame and music and a bunch of cool shit and, and had to take a hard pivot. Um, really, really interesting, you know, uh, hearing his backstory. So I'll leave that to you guys to listen to. Thank you guys for listening. Without further ado, my buddy, Justin Nault. 
This is good contact. Talk, talk about being important. I just, anytime I drive through a gate, I feel important, man. I like there's something up. to it, right? Yeah. You know, it's funny. Um, of all the things that have gone right and wrong since starting the farm, our gate's the fucking worst thing we've ever put in. Really? It's been a constant nuisance. People get locked in where they can't get out. Our clicker, you, you know, if you don't have a clicker, you're fucked. And like the, the buttons work some, st- works and sometimes they don't work. Sometimes it just holds open. We're worried about losing exotic animals and shit. So you got to yeah, like yeah. stand guard at the gate till the gate guy fixes it. <laughs> I was like, there's no way that that's happening to anyone in Westlake. Yeah. Like there's parts of Austin, <laughs> Dallas, you know, where it's like the, the lowest serviceman is still going to do a better job than whatever the fuck this is. Yeah, you know? yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. And he's never charged us for the install because it's that bad. <laughs> and it's like, I just want to fucking bring in somebody that actually knows how to install, even if they have to drive an hour from Lakeway or somewhere else just to fucking do a good job and actually give us a gate that works. Yeah. Because we've got events here. We're doing a ton of shit here. Yeah, yeah. And it's a constant nuisance. Constant. Yeah. It's true. My dad built a, a lake house out in, in Lebanon, Tennessee, which is like, you know, 45 minutes to an hour outside of the city. And same thing. Like you're just not getting the, the the highest quality workers are where the densest population is. It makes sense, right? Uh-huh. So it's like these guys come out completely screw something up, and he's like, "This is the exact opposite I wanted you to do. Can you please fix this?" They're like, "Yeah, we'll be there in six months." It's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, mental. We've got a list of people ahead of you. It's slim picking, man. How do I get a gate? Uh, a button? I need a clicker. Need Am a clicker. I important you enough for be, that? You got to be either a, uh, an, a daily employee, which we have many. Did you get to meet all the guys out there? I met Eric Dean. I met Liberty. Cool. That was it. Those three. Yeah. Okay, we'll introduce you to Fox. He's our animal manager, and I think Brent should be by today, the plant manager. Eric kind of runs the whole show here uh, from an operations standpoint, GM, all that good shit. He's, he's the right-hand homie that makes shit happen, which, and we've got a whole team outside of the boys that um, you know really run the operations. We have a president named Amy Giles who works with fucking everything that we do with Fit for Service and all the Aubrey's team. She's awesome. Jen is our accountant. Like we're, it's, it's full on. Yeah. It's dude. pretty cool. You yeah, know, like learning, learning from other people that are in this space. Um, you know, it's usually like, uh, like, like Daniel Griffith, the guy we learned from, it's him and his wife and there's three kids that are super young. So it's him and his wife, 365 days a year. And his father helped them get the farm. He's an investor in the farm, but it's just him and his wife running the whole thing. I'm like, damn dude, wow. that's how it's going down, you know, for yeah. most, most of the places and we're very blessed to have the, the bandwidth and ability to do it correctly from the start. You know, like within, we have the means to make, because mm. I would be stretched way too thin if I had to juggle everything the boys are doing. Like I, I wouldn't be able to operate. I wouldn't be able to be around my family. I wouldn't be able to podcast. I wouldn't be able to coach and fit for service. None of that shit. Without. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's, it's been a huge blessing, but I'm excited to show you the place. Let's talk about, let's talk about meeting each other back in the day because you know what's cool is, is Monsal is a good friend of ours and... Mm-hmm. I knew on our trip, that's the reason I went, I went to meet people. I yeah. was excited that I met you. I was excited that I met Monsal. I was not excited about how we were hunting. Yeah. You know, like yeah. I haven't done one since, right? Yeah. Like shooting out of blinds. It's like, this doesn't get me going. You know, yeah. It doesn't feel yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but we got to meet awesome people. We really got to hang with the carnivore dog, Paul Saladino. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but since that one, Monsal's done like 70 hunts. Dude, so many. I yeah. ran into him at Barton. And he was just explaining to me what was happening, like how his business is doing. It's crazy. Yeah, he's doing great. And uh, my wife, Tosh, and Eric's wife, Leah, are getting ready to do a women's only uh, hunt. That'll be their first hunting experience, both of them. So I'm like, fuck yeah, go off with Monsal and Uncle Nate and enjoy yourselves. But I think yeah. back to that, like, it was right. I, was, I had heard of Monsal and uh, Saladino invited me. And I was like, fuck yeah, man, I want to get in. I want to get some bow action in. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was a minute ago. And now... You know, his hunts have changed entirely. There's a ceremonial aspect and things mm-hmm. like that that weren't there before when we did it. Um, how many, what is that, 2018 or 19? Might be 18, dude. I've lived here for two years now. I think I was living in Colorado when I did that hunt with you. Yeah, that was 20, 20, 2019. Yeah. One of the things that, I, that stuck out to me was that, you know, and this is no, 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 uh, I don't want to shit on Paul. Paul is my homie. Yeah. I, I asked him, you know, who's going to be on this hunt? And he said, you know, it's handpicked, hand selected. So I was like, all right, it's going to be like the, the one I did with Peter Atia and, and Kyle Tierman and, and Dr. Chris Ryan and, and yeah. Ben Greenfield, you know, like all these like yeah, yeah, yeah. handpicked. That's what I assumed. Yeah. And then I, I, we were there and he was like, yeah, he, he reached out to his Instagram following. So it was 
mostly his followers, right? Totally. And there were some dope people. Yeah. But there was a lot of uh, hardcore carnivore folks yeah. that had a piece of the puzzle correct, but not all yeah, of it. Yeah, totally. And it was hilarious listening to the conversations, but listening to your addition to those conversations showed me just the wellspring of knowledge that you have in this field as well. And that felt great because I was like, good, I'm not the only one here that, that knows women shouldn't fucking eat pure meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, like, yeah. That's going to fuck Intermittent fasting plus carnivore. <laughs> this is the ultimate fertility diet. Yeah, no, yeah, it was, no. It was cracking me up that people couldn't wrap their head around that. And so, but that was a, that was a bonding moment for me where I felt like I was, I was like, oh no, am I surrounded by people that only know one way up the mountain? You yeah, know? yeah. And uh, even since then, Paul has changed tremendously with the inclusion of raw dairy and fruit and loads of honey and- yeah. Um, I, I knew think, that was coming, man, because there's so much, like, did you ever get into, like, lean mass hyper responders, like Dave Feldman's work around cholesterol? Huh. There's this whole group of people, there's Facebook groups around it, lean mass hyper responder. Basically, you have very low body fat and very lean, but just sky high cholesterol. And I, fat, I fit in this, like, perfectly. My total cholesterol does, was, like, over 500. Does like, um, ectomorphs, or does it have less to do with that? You know, like, ecto, meso, I, I think it has less to do with that and more to do with, like, what I think we have in health and wellness is, is an available energy crisis. Like people get so obsessed with macros and calories and all these different things where like they forget that the point of a human metabolism is to turn food into energy. And if you put yourself into a low energy state, which is like the core of everything I teach, is most people are walking around in a low energy state, you're going to have problems and you can solve almost any problem coming from that. This is where you end up with carnivores. Uh, there was someone on the trip that was explaining to me, he was like, I've been carnivore for two years, whatever. Like, if I take a sip of bone broth, I'm in the bathroom. If I eat a fucking blueberry, I'm in the bathroom. And I'm like, understand, you have not healed yourself. This is still a, an incredibly weak metabolism that you're dealing with. The metabolic machinery is fucked up. And it's an energy problem. And this lean mass hyper-responder thing, it's in these groups and I'm learning about it. And I got diagnosed familial hypercholesterolemia by William Cromwell, who Rob Wolf introduced me to. He's this world-class lipidologist and they want to put me on a statin. I'm 30 years old. I was like, Whoa. what is going on with all this? You know? So I started digging into something called bioenergetics, which is basically like everything you do is through the lens of increasing metabolic rate, increasing core body temperature, generating more ATP in your cells, just making like turning yourself into a Ferrari, basically. Yeah, just getting like, the mitochondrial matrix to fucking pop. Exactly. You're just cranking out, like everything is functioning perfectly at the electron transport chain. That's what it's all about, right? But this lean mass hyper responder thing, I'm watching these guys for like years with all these hypotheses. And it was, it was engineers, people that had come from engineering backgrounds that are like, look, high cholesterol is not bad if you look at the whole contextual thing. And I'm like, yeah, but where does the sky high cholesterol come from? People, it was from eating animal fat. Animal fat just makes your, your cholesterol sky high. It's actually that you're not creating energy the way that you should be because what happens on carnivore, and I, I don't think I'm speaking out of line on this, but like with Paul, what Paul saw before he added in all these carbs and raw milk and all this stuff is incredibly low T3. You downregulate your thyroid function because you're not taking in enough energy. Like the body does actually like burning carbohydrates for fuel. And you know this, especially being an athlete, if you're doing like super hard workouts mm -hmm. or something like, if you crank a bunch of like, you know, whole organic fruit and raw honey, and then go do a hard workout, you're probably gonna feel better during that hard workout than if you were intermittent fasting or following keto or following carnivore. To, to, your, to your point, I just wanna add, this is 100% true. That's why even people who followed strict paleo Mm -hmm. would complain about not having enough carbs on deck because they were eliminating starches and different different yes. avenues where you could get a boatload of, of carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates, you know, at the end of the day, still come down to simple carbs, but it was the bolus yeah. that you could store. And, you know, for Dr. Sean Baker and, and everything great that he's done with, with helping people to heal and same with Paul Saladino, you know, the process of gluconeogenesis always leaves you with enough carbohydrates mm -hmm. For, per, per se, yeah. right? The liver's going to be full. You have some glycogen stores if your body's doing gluconeogenesis correctly. But it doesn't give you the bolus. It never gives you that pre-workout, you know, where now I can skyrocket. Now I can totally. go run a fucking marathon. Now I can, you know, lift and then recover for a couple hours and then go to jujitsu. Mm -hmm. you know, like you're doing high glycolytic output or high intensity intervals or even just really long duration shit. I think for the high intensity stuff and your glycolytic, it's a must have. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is to like, if you look at it, things still tend to fall through the lens of calories in, calories out always. Like it somehow comes back to that. Even if you get people that are like, well, not all calories are created equal. If you really look across the board at what's happening, whether it's vegan or carnivore or keto or paleo or weight watchers or intermittent fasting or fasting, it is all through the lens of restriction. So the entirety of the industry is focused on how do we burn more fat? They're not looking at the mechanisms of why some people store more fat. 
And this is where you start to look into things like ATP, right? Like there are studies that show like depressed and anxious subjects generate 20% less ATP than healthy subjects. Obese individuals generate less ATP than non-obese individuals. But the story is energy balance, energy in, energy out. That's not how this works. It's potential energy in, potential energy out. Can the metabolic machinery take the substrate and turn it into energy? Or is the substrate that's coming in wildly inflammatory, which disrupts everything in the metabolism from the citric acid cycle on to to the electron transport chain. And all of a sudden, you're just wasting energy, right? Like you could do this with something like DNP. You could take a bunch of DNP and you're going to waste a bunch of energy and your, your, you know, metabolic rate's going to skyrocket and you're going to be super hot. You can kill yourself doing too much of it. Or if you take cyanide, right? Can't make ATP, you're dead, right? What's happening with obese people is they actually have a low energy problem, but we're teaching them that it's their own lazy gluttony. They're taking in too much excess energy. And that's the problem is when you're focusing on calories, right? Like, which is like heat energy. And then there's nutrients, which are like the actual things that we're eating. You know, like calories are just a measure of potential energy. Nutrients are real things. It's like you talked about this with plants earlier, like the energy of the plants. What is happening here? Like cofactors and enzymes are real. So if you take somebody who's super obese and you completely remove ultra-processed hyperpalatable junk and you just give them a whole foods diet and that's it and you make sure that they follow that strictly, everything else kind of goes away. You don't need to worry about the calorie counting and then you don't need to tack on all this additional stress. Like an obese person, storing body fat is an adaptation to a stressed metabolism. Mm. And this is where you'll get the mainstream. Well, you don't metabolic damage isn't real. If your metabolism was damaged, you would die, which is like, no, it's like if you took cyanide and couldn't make any energy, yes, you would die. But if you look at an obese, uh, an obese person, right? Like they're kind of slowly dying. Like their metabolic machinery cannot do what it's supposed to do efficiently, which leads to all these problems. And we have convinced everyone that you need to feed them. If they're not losing weight at 1800, you got to feed them 1500 calories. If they're not losing weight at 1500 calories, you got to feed them 1100. I have women coming to me that are eating less than 1100 calories a day Oof. and they're 250 and, pounds. And Flo hasn't seen them in a year. <laughs> exactly. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's the same thing with the triad of female athletes. Like when we first uh, started hanging out at the time, I was doing a lot more work with fighters. Um, the most you know, successful fighter I had, her name's Pauline Pita Macias, and she did uh, Dana White's Contender Series and everything, and she introduced me to Dana, and like, it was really cool to be around her, but I was in charge of all of her weight cuts, and she used to like literally run around bragging. I was just like, I still have my period. He cut 36 pounds off me in two weeks. I'm fighting at 115, and like, I got my period yesterday. It's like unheard of in women, and, and it is always this low energy state. So I'm constantly trying to help people get out of the low energy state. So I, the way I describe it is I'm helping people improve their metabolic function through the lens of abundance and through the lens of self-love instead of the lens of restriction, sacrifice, and self-loathing. Well, I want to I I comment on that because a couple of things, that, there's two really important points that I want to tease out from that. One is similar to Paul Cech, you know, saying like an obese person is starved yes. for the right nutrients. Exactly. They're, they're, they're starved. And so you feed them what they need first before you ever withdraw. Yes, that something yes. Something that he really hammered in me because I thought it was the other way around, you know? Yeah. I thought, hey, let's jumpstart the system. Let's do the let's do the thing. And he's like, that's not true. They need the things they've been missing for as long as they've been missing it to catch up. Then once that's all stockpiled, then we can start to look at different mm-hmm. ways to, to manage. That's one thing that's really important that you just mentioned. The other piece, have you read Charles Eisenstein, Eisenstein's book on fat loss? I've not, no. It is dope. Nobody knows about it either. Like, yeah. You know, everybody knows about the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible and sacred economics and, and many that's of his the popular one works. Yeah, he has a very economic. small one that's on the psychology around fat loss. And, and what you're pointing to there, the self-love aspect, is 100% necessary, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's always a mental emotional aspect to eating. There's a mental emotional aspect to how our body, you know, if we're, sh- if we're showing signs of dis-ease, mm-hmm. there's something in there. You know, the body keeps the score. There's something in there that also needs love and attention and us to look at mm. in addition to what we're changing. Yeah, absolutely. I-, I had an interview with a woman named Trisha Nelson. She's amazing. She has a, a book called Seven, it's called Heal Your Hunger, Seven Steps to End Emotional Eating Now. And I had her on the show and she helped me realize that like, there's an unbelievable correlation between obese women and sexual abuse as children. Mm. So there's literally like a, I'm subconsciously making myself less attractive because I feel safer. And to be clear, I'm not saying these women are less attractive. I'm saying that societal norms, you walk in a grocery store and every magazine is a bikini model who weighs 110 pounds, right? Like the, the general societal standards of beauty 
they're kind of bucking them in this way that, that almost keeps them safe, you know? And that was when everything I do starts through the lens of personal development. And I always say that, you know, I've said this publicly for 250 podcasts now, so maybe it takes away from what it is, but Clovis is a Trojan horse. You, Clovis is my company, right? Mm-hmm. You can come to me and say, I need to lose 50 pounds. And I'm like, you do? I'm like, yeah, I definitely need to lose 50 pounds. I'm like, all right, cool. That's a problem you have? They're like, yeah. I'm like, all right, if you insist, let's, let's fix this problem, right? And the first thing I have them do is in the least amount of clothing they're comfortable with by themselves every morning, stand in the mirror, look yourselves in the eye and say, I love you 10 times and fucking mean it. And what happens in the vast majority of these women, because I have people that are coming to me, the system has completely failed them. They have multiple autoimmune conditions. They're suffering from chronic health conditions. They might be full-blown type 2 diabetic. They're 150 to 200 pounds overweight. They burst into tears. The first time they say, I love you in the mirror, they burst into tears. And then they come back to me. They're like, I can't do this. And then I created this meditation called the 40 slides meditation, where I just have them sit down, meditate, and I want them to come up with 40 moments in their life where they were proud of themselves. Mm -hmm. And every time an image of being proud of yourself pops in your head, say, I love you out loud, or I love myself, whichever one feels better to you, right? And they come back to me, I can't do that. I sat there for 30 minutes. I thought of four things. And I'm like, well, what were the things, right? It's always huge things. It's like, I got my PhD or I got married or I won the game winning, you know, three pointer in high school or whatever. It's these big, big moments. And all we're doing is just like shifting. I always say that I'm just shifting the lens through which you view reality, like an eye doctor, right? It's like, how does this one look? Okay, let's try this one, right? And I get them to a point where I'm like, did you say I love you to your kids on their way out the door yesterday? Did you hold the door open at the bank for some old lady? Did you tell your husband last night before bed that you appreciate him and you love the way he cares for your family? Did you get on a call with me, a coach who you have hired to help you get healthy? Did you eat off the approved foods list that I gave you? Did you go for a walk and get some sunshine? And they start to see, like, I can do a 40 slides meditation in three minutes. I'll come up with 40 things I'm super proud of, you know? Yeah. And I help them see, and it's this, this transition where there's a belief, and it's, again, it's because of societal standards and mostly the mainstream that are just like, you piece of shit, you need to eat less, move more, eat less, move more, do your cold plunges, do your intermittent fasting, like when their body's already in an unbelievably stressed state. And they just loathe themselves because they can't do the things they're being told to do. And I just help them switch the lens where it's like, you don't become a healthy person after you lose 50 pounds. You adopt the identity of a healthy person today and you make all your choices through the lens of that healthy person. And three months from now, six months from now, 12 months from now, your entire life is different. You don't recognize any aspect of your life. Yes, you lost the, fi- you lost the 50 pounds, but now your relationships are better. Like I would say this that like, credentials, right? Like my credentials are that people have Clovis tattoos on their bodies <laughs> because they lost the weight and then they left their abusive husband and they moved from a city they hate to a city they love and they built a community and now like everything changes. So it's like we have this idea that health and wellness, people set health and wellness goals. In my experience, most people who don't want to be the rock or don't want to win the CrossFit games or be an Instagram model, health and wellness is not a goal. It's an obstacle and it's preventing them from living their best life. So I'm just like, okay, let's not do this goal game. We're just removing the obstacle so you can do what you're meant to do. Like, what's your unique ability? What do you want to do in the world? Like, how do you want to show up? What do you want your family life to be like? Because I've noticed that health and wellness obsession is a massive avoidance pattern. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, so we're, again, we got two sides, two sides of darkness and the middle path is the light, right? Yeah, yeah. One side is an over-obsession right? Where all things are dependent upon, you know, how you look. If mm-hmm. I can get to 5% body fat and hold it or whatever the fucking marker is, yeah. my 500 pound squat, then I'll be good enough. Mm-hmm. Then I'll be strong enough. Then I'll, then I won't fear the outside world. Then I, then I'll think I'm beautiful, you know, whatever the fucking thing is. And the other side of that is being so divorced from ever having those feelings of good relationship, mm-hmm. happy, healthy home. I'm at, I'm at home and at peace within my own body. And I had to go through this myself, you know, like from, from a young age, not feeling at home, not feeling myself and just pounding booze, you know, and then getting Mm. big for football and then fighting, like really helped me hone that. So while I was working on meditation and plant medicines, I was also taking care of myself so I could see this visceral difference between fight camp and after fight. Mm. Um, But for people that have never connected those dots, they don't even know what they're looking for. And I think that's what's a tremendous piece that you're offering is is the shit they're not thinking about, right? Because yeah. the aesthetics are a side effect of doing it right. 
And, and yes, you'll fucking look great and you'll feel great, but it's the feeling great. It's the ability to have emotional intelligence with your family, to fucking make relationships work, to bring joy into everything you do. That's the thing you're shooting for. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, let, let's take a goal of six pack abs, right? If someone's never had a six pack and they, I have one client who came to me, wanted six pack abs, still coaching with me two years later, just launched his first business and month one did like 95 grand, like changed his whole life, right? Just like, and so I'm just like, you want a six pack? Yeah. All right. All right. Cool. Let's dive in. Right. And we just start like poking around his internal life and his internal world. And you think it's the six pack that you want. It's like, what's the emotional experience you're trying to have when you have the six pack? So for most people, it's like a, a six pack goal tends to come from like a fragile masculine place, right? It's like, I want to flex in some kind of way, literally, you know, so there's an emotional state that they're trying to get to, whether it's self-confidence or the removal of insecurity or whatever it may be. We can focus on that emotional goal, that emotional endpoint without the six pack, right? So oddly enough, you end up with the six pack because you stop caring about the six pack. It's kind of the way like, like manifestation works. It's like, if you're just like completely obsessed and you're going to blow your brains out if you don't get a six pack, like you might never get the six pack. Some well, that, people might. That's, that's Paul Check's echo test. You know, you stand at the Grand Canyon and say, I want to lose 20 pounds and feel great. The echo that comes back is I want to yeah. lose 20 pounds and feel great. So you're always chasing the thing that's out in front of you rather yeah. than I've lost 20 pounds. I feel this is the best I've ever felt and I have a six pack. And as, as you begin to let that come back in, in the now, even yeah. before it's there, you're living from that place. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the thing is like with you, right? We've both been in similar situations. Um, you know Joe Hawley, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, he's a good buddy. Yeah, Joe has Life Beyond the Game. Mm-hmm. I did his podcast and not being an athlete, right? Like you guys are like it, crazy athletes. It's amazing. But the reason he had me on is because I was in the music industry for 15 years. You know, I was doing 300 shows a year. I got a network reality TV show when I was 25. I was like fucking living the dream in Nashville, you know, like especially like age 21. I'm at like one of the most popular bars in Nashville just doing the thing. And it's like this, it's, it's kind of like you were saying, I mean, I was drunk six nights a week for 10 years, bro. <laughs> we connected well on this. Yeah, yeah. The hunt. You know, like, yep, I get that. Yeah, and that's the thing is you get to this place where you're like, what happens when you get the thing that you want? And the thing that you want is rarely the thing that you want, right? Because I had this experience where I'm like, this is amazing. I'm traveling around and I'm doing all these shows, whatever. And then it didn't take long. I mean, probably 10 years into that 15 year career where I was like, oh, this is kind of a prison sentence. Like I have to be at this place at this time. I can't really travel the world. I don't have any like strong romantic relationships or strong friendships. I'm on stage six nights a week. I was, there were some weeks where I was doing nine shows in a week, you know? So it's like, what, what was I doing all this for? The money wasn't that great, you know? And I had this, this vision, but it took me a long time to tease this apart that I was just desperately seeking external validation. I started playing piano when I was eight. And the first time I did it, all the grownups went crazy. And they were like, this fucking kid, this is the next Billy Joel. He's a phenom. You know, and I was like, what? I can just do this. All right, people seem to like this. Then high school comes and I play this talent show and I'm on the news and all this stuff. And I became like this like small town celebrity. And I had no, I had a 2.8 GPA in high school. I don't know what I want to do. You had me you know? beat. Yeah, it was terrible, bro. So I was like, in my mind, I was like, all right, I either need to like try to go to college or go to the Marine Corps. Like I remember I went to a Marine Corps like recruiting place and was chatting with them. I applied to one school. I applied to Berkeley College of Music and that was it. I was like, if I don't get into Berkeley, I'm going to go be a Marine. And like, thankfully I got into Berkeley and I ended up moving to Boston doing all this thing. But like, like it took me so long to tease out. I don't really love this thing the way that I should right? Like, yes. Is it fun? When I was a kid, I loved playing. The moment it became like my career and what I eventually ended up calling golden handcuffs is I found myself miserable in that place. And I couldn't, like it used to be, you know, I'd be on break during a gig and I'd go get drunk with friends. And then all of a sudden, like I'm on break at a gigs and I'm like hiding in the parking garage, like reading, you know, tools of Titans or four hour work week or something. And just like, all right, I need something to change. And I had gotten around a lot of these, like these nineties bands, like collective soul and tonic and Google Goo dolls and stuff. And I'd like met these guys and got to like hang out with them. I'm spending time with them. And I was like, this is not what I want. Like I'm looking at their lives in their fifties and I don't want to put down anybody's life, but I'm like, they're still on the road. They're still doing the thing. Some of them are on like their fourth marriage and they're still drunk every night or whatever. And I was like, I could kind of see where this was going. And I ended up having this full blown shift. And another thing that we connected heavily on was that was where like my first psychedelic experience, I think it was 28 and it was spirit quest with Don Howard. Dope. I had not touched a mushroom, <clears throat> nothing. I, was like, I know like booze. My wife, her first journey was a half an ounce of mushrooms. <laughs> wow, well, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, dude. I mean, yeah. that was it, and it, it was it was like on. I came back and I was like, I have to get out. I knew, like, I need to get out of the music industry. This is like crushing my soul. And I remember having a moment too, which 
kind of is like a full circle thing now that I think about it. I didn't even think about this. I was doing a CrossFit wad after Spirit Quest. And like maybe it was a dick move, but I was doing like thrusters for time or something. And I like dropped the bar on the ground and I was like, this is bad for me. And I left. I just walked out of the gym and I never did CrossFit again. Like I had all these little moments clicking in my mind after ayahuasca where I was just like, I'm really hurting myself, striving for something that I don't even know is mine. And I ended up doing these podcasts, like one was called Who's Happy Are You Chasing? And another one was called Whose Dreams Are You Chasing? And I was like, I'm just doing things that have fallen in my lap of like, oh yeah, you're good at this thing, do this thing and it will lead to X, Y, Z. And it was really the internal experience of psychedelics, which has led me now, I'm 37 now. So that, you know, ayahuasca was nine years ago. Um, and there's been a lot of psychonautic exploration since, which we could talk about if you want to. Um, but really what I'm trying to help people do is take back their own personal authority. The more you outsource your authority, the bigger trouble you're going to get into over time. You will end up out of alignment with self because you're living a life of shoulds. And this is where I see so many people that come to me and I call them, they're, they're all recovering from diets. They're <laughs> recovering keto, recovering carnivore, recovering vegan, recovering intermittent fasting, right? And it's like, well, for the first two months, it was so great. Everything was amazing. Like low carb is definitely the way. And I'm like, they don't realize they literally just cut out poison. It's like poison food. That's, it. That's the only thing I teach. And I don't care who gets mad about it. I get so much hate online about this because I'm like, Pop-Tarts, poison. Steak, food. Yeah. Organic apple, food. Well, I want to, and I want to dive into this, you know, with with you because I, I, there's a couple of people that come to mind, and I definitely want to get back to psychedelics because I think that, that <laughs> yeah. you know, people that follow this conversation, you know, I, I haven't I haven't had too many. I'm, I'm reaching out to the fans or the, the, the listener, not fans, the listeners, to find out what they want to hear more of and what they want to hear less of. Okay. You know, we had our first one back, and it was like, hey, less supplement companies, but more on spirituality, more on, you know, mobility, optimization, that kind of shit. It was yeah. only one. Yeah. And I fucking, that hit hard. I was like, all right, done. Uh, even though I, I'm a fucking huge fan of supplements, having come from that industry and worked in the industry, uh, we can have less of those. Totally cool. But thinking about, um, you know, the podcast coming up and different things like that, I, I'm thinking about, you know, everywhere I want to take this and the bucket list mm. guests that I have on and it's, and it's getting good. And then this conversation is such a perfect time because Part of it too, you know, when I'm thinking of framing, there is a particular path that I want to take people on so they can come to the same conclusions you're talking about, right? If we look back to 2020, how do we get ourselves into that mix up? It was from people giving away their personal authority. 100%. Right? And Dr. Bruce Lipton, Biology of Belief, he said, from, the, from before you're born, your parents give away their authority as your medicine people to a doctor. Mm -hmm. Your dad is in the waiting room or he's watching you get pulled out by a dude in a white lab coat. Mm. It's not hands-on. Yeah. They're going to clean you and keep you away from mom before they finally give you to mom. They're going to cut the umbilical cord too soon. They're going to do a whole bunch of things that shouldn't happen. Yeah. Bright-ass lights. You need Dr. Cruz fluorescent lights. <laughs> lights that are fucking you up. Yeah. Brand new, brand new cells. Yeah. And, and anytime you get sick, where do you go? Mm. You go to the dude in the white lab coat. Mm -hmm. Right, and so that just patterns in. This person makes me better. Mm -hmm. It's not someone from the village. It's not you know the the family medicine doctor. It's not the fucking personalized visit from when medicine doctors would come to the house. Mm -hmm. Right, it's none of that shit. And um, that is getting rid of your authority. There's no yeah. two ways about it. So I'm thinking about that. Like that's such a big one. What I wanted to tease out in this conversation too is there are people you know that I think have a certain narrative. And they have a big audience, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and Jack Cruz did a fucking awesome job with Dr. Andrew Huberman. Yes. Huberman's a buddy. He's been on this podcast twice. I'll link to this in the show notes. It's six hours it from last May on Rick Rubin's podcast. Mm -hmm. And uh, I loved it because Huberman listened. He learned. He did so much where he did. It wasn't a fucking argument, but no. he let Jack take him to school yeah. on the differences in what he knows from having started in the similar education of as he closed the, the ivory towers yeah. into what, what became his process of understanding things differently. And I think we need more of that. But what we see are people that are gung-ho on a certain path. And there's, there's a couple that come to mind. One, Mike Dolce comes to mind. Even though from what you've said thus far, quite a few of the things you've said on just do, doing a whole food diet instead of cutting out stuff, that's right in line with some of the stuff he says. Yeah. Bio Lane, Lane Norton, another yeah. guy that comes to mind. Yeah. 
So I want to dive into what are the things you agree with them on and what are the things you disagree with them on? Yeah, I mean, both of them preach the importance of protein and whole foods, right? It's, it's hilarious to me that like Lane is very openly like, yeah, eat more protein and it will change your body composition, but all calories are created equal. You're like, wait a second, what, what is happening here, right? And like, so in terms of what I agree with them on, I love fitness. We've talked about this a lot. I'm a purple belt in jujitsu. I've done powerlifting. I've done CrossFit, bodybuilding, all the things. I love fitness for a number of reasons, not necessarily for fat loss, not the main driver. Um, but in terms of what I agree with them on, I mean, that's about as far as it goes, man. Like I fundamentally believe that telling people to eat less food to get healthy is some of the worst health advice that has ever been given in the history of the world. And we can take this far back. Everyone loves to say, oh, we eat more than we used to. And it's like this, these studies that say from 1970 to 2006, um, the average American consumes 570 more calories or something like that. They're not going back far enough in time. Like the 1939 yearbook of agriculture studied the diets of Americans living in New York City. So this is 1939, which means like 20% of Americans still owned their own working farm. It's like red meat, eggs, bread, butter. Bacon, butter. It, exactly, right? The average 150... Homemade bread too, by the way. Exactly, right? Like fermented sourdough. Shit. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Even go back to the 50s. The, the average, like all of the foods on store shelves in the 1950s had between one to five ingredients. Today, the average ingredient number is 29 in grocery stores. What is that? It's a Franken food. It doesn't exist in nature. It's so simple. It's just like, if you go hike in the forest for the rest of your life, you will never stumble upon a bagel tree. <laughs> it's like truly that simple. And as you know, with Paul Check and plant medicines and all these things, it's like food is data, man. Like you're giving data to your system and telling it what to do with the data that's incoming, right? So the 1939 yearbook of agriculture, the average 155 pound male was consuming 4,200 calories a day. Damn, I believe that, especially with how hard they're working. Yeah, well, and that's the thing. Just but, burning through it. But that's the thing, kind of, right? Because what was the average job then? Maybe like a, a, a working in a mill or a factory or something like that? Well, whether like, it was factory or farming, it was yeah. an all-day deal. Totally, you know? yeah. And yeah, to your point, because they weren't damaging themselves with poison, they were more optimized. So their body exactly. was efficient with it. Even they're yeah. probably, you know, like the, 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 the look of the old timers then, I'm picturing someone that's fucking skinny and leathery and strong as shit. Yeah, yeah. You know? But they don't look like The Rock. Yeah. Right? Like The right. Rock right now, I looked this up because I was like, wait, is this right? Like, what is happening here? <laughs> and like The Rock, according to the internet, which is probably true, you know, he <laughs> consumes like 4,400 calories a day. And he's an absolute monster. Like, this is 100, I weigh 174 pounds right now. We're talking about 155 pound man. And then I took it further a little bit. There's a study in 1944. I don't know if you ever heard of this called the Minnesota Starvation Experiment. No. Oh, dude. It's incredible, right? So like the baseline diet for the, they were called them healthy adult males that they took into this starvation experiment and it was controlled like they're in a laboratory setting for like over six months. It's crazy, like crazy volunteers. Their baseline diet was held for about 12 weeks and they were eating around 3,200 calories per day. They put them on a starvation diet for 24 weeks. And in that 24 weeks, I mean, these, the pictures of these guys are insane. They look like prisoner of war, like people, it's, it's horrible. And they were talking about like, Increased depression and anxiety. They all became hypochondriacs, all loss of libido, like no interest in sexual anything. They had to be helped upstairs, help opening doors. They were trying to sneak bubble gum and like eat bubble gum to just get more calories because their stomach hurt so bad. How much do you think they were eating during the starvation period? A thousand calories a day? 1,560 calories. Dang. And I'm telling you, man, like they, so to go from 3,200 calories a day to 1,560 calories a day, He's like psychosis. A bunch of people dropped out. They for couldn't extended, maintain it. Well, that's stay there. I wanna, for an extended period study, of time. Yeah, yes. extended, right? So we can have an acute stressor in the short term yes. that can have benefit. Uh, but anything that becomes chronic, that's, that's going to be a chronic. There's going to be chronic issues that come with it. Yeah, it's like, like cold plunge, sauna, or fasting, right? These are all like acute stressors that are unbelievably beneficial. They can be. But like I remember I got my cold plunge and I was listening to a lot of Jack Cruz stuff and it was at like 50 degrees and I was like, I'm just going to go for 45 minutes. I'm going to see what happens, you know? <laughs> it took me like a fucking day to recover, but I did. I was yeah. like neck high for 45 minutes. <laughs> and I was like, went inside to try to make coffee in the French press. Was like, I was like, what have I done to myself? But like, that's also, I have that in me. I have a lot of the Goggins type stuff. I've done the same thing with psychedelics with you. Like I've like blasted myself in ways that were like arguably like a little masochistic and a lot came from it. Like I've learned a lot from it, you know? So you're right. Like acute versus chronic is important, but this is what I'm saying is you find these, I have women that come to me that have been yo-yo dieting forever. 
you know, since they were 13 years old and they got put on birth control because they had a fucking headache, <laughs> you know? And then they're like, they've been in that medical system for so long. And the weird thing that happens in, in my mind with all of this stuff, especially with like the, what we would call mainstream influencers who are very like dog on bone, this is the thing. And they love to call everyone else like quacks and spreading misinformation and all this stuff. You know this, especially from like fit for service or something, right? Like most people that go out into the world and they're trying to help, they're trying to be of service and try to help people improve their lives. They're usually sharing what's worked for them or what's worked for their clients or like in our cases, both, right? I will tell people, this is what's worked for me. Here's my journey. You can adopt some of these things and see if your life changes for the better, right? Now, like my private Facebook group has over 10,500 members and people have Clovis tattoos and there's before and after pictures that are astonishing, like a hundred plus pounds loss, video testimonials. They're crying, they're sobbing. They just changed my whole life. Oh my God, everything is amazing, right? Then the, the first questions you ever get if you're spreading health information online is what are your credentials <laughs> and show me the studies. Uh -huh. Those are the two things. Show me the studies, bro. And what are your credentials? Now let's do an about face and look at the credentialed world. For some reason, in America, the world of credentials, the higher your credentials are, the less you are required to produce beneficial results of any fucking kind whatsoever, right? Like you don't walk into your local MD's office and you see a wall of before and after pictures and video testimonies of <laughs> someone who is- They don't fucking exist. They don't That's exist, That's one reason bro. they're not up. They it don't exist. It is the mainstream system where people get sicker and sicker and sicker and they spend more and more and more money pharmaceutical drugs and mainstream medicine are the third leading cause of death in America. So, but the propaganda machine is so strong, dude, that people will come to me at 300 pounds. They've been working with doctors for 15 years. They're skeptical of me. They're not skeptical of the doc. I have to change their mind. And usually that's just showing up in love and empathy and like, hey, like, you're not crazy. These people are gaslighting you. Like, this is not your fault. We need to fix some things, right? And this is where my buddy, Zach Tellender, and um, Derek from More Plates, More Dates. Oh, cool. They did the... Um, we were chatting with him about coming on last time he was in town. Yeah, dude. You remember they did the Liver King Exposed video? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like Zach and, and Derek, and then Rogan ended up sharing it and everything because Zach had this, this whole thing about charlatans. He's like describing what a charlatan is. He's calling Liver King a charlatan, <laughs> right? And it's like in-group, out-group language, always on the offensive, claiming to have sacred knowledge, right? And, it's all, and, and I'm looking at it and like, I love Zach. He's a personal friend of mine. He's a great guy. I'm watching the video and I'm like, how are people not seeing the hypocrisy in this? Like, it's so easy to call Liver King a charlatan or to call me a charlatan. Meanwhile, we have thousands of testimonies and stories of people transforming their lives. They cannot see mainstream medicine, mainstream nutrition, dietitians, doctors, PhDs. It is the ultimate charlatan. It's just that their propaganda machine is way better than ours. It's and it has than trillions everything. of dollars behind it. Yeah, it's better than every. I'll, I'll link in the show notes um, a documentary that Aubrey just put together with our homie Ben Stewart okay. called Unsafe and Ineffective. Mm. Mind-blowing. But when you get to you know the screen side-by-side, side, uh, brought to you by Pfizer, yeah, brought yeah, to yeah, you yeah. by Pfizer, brought to you by Pfizer, brought to you by Pfizer, there's fucking thousands of these. Like, yeah. Those networks are owned. They've been owned, mm -hmm. right? There was three back in the day. That weren't The people that came into own networks weren't, it wasn't fucking happenstance. No. Right? Like, no. And now there's thousands of TV channels and thousands of radio stations, and it's nine companies yeah. that own the total. That's, that's mind-blowing. So like people think there, there's no... You're getting one source of information, one slice, and uh, that slice doesn't work. Yeah. It doesn't fucking work. It hasn't been working. It is a failed experiment, brother. We have been told to eat less, move more for 70-plus years, and it coincides perfectly with the rocket ship hockey stick growth of obesity and chronic disease. It's crazy. It's, it's, it is the ultimate failed experiment. It's like, it's mind boggling to me because you have these people that go out into the world and they're just so confidently like, look at me in my intellect. And the only reason they can do it the way they do it, like Lane is a good example of this. Like I have a lot of empathy for Lane because his whole experience is just shitting on people. And I, I, I know too much about spirituality and personal development to think that this guy is in a good way. That's a weight. That's it's, a fucking big yeah, vest to carry. For sure, man. You know, and I, I am pretty unfazed by online hate. And I don't know if it's because I was a musician, I was on stage for so long or whatever, but like my girlfriend, Megan had like a really hard time with it when she first, I've been dating her for three years and she had, she's a beauty mogul. She had a massive beauty company. 
And once she got to see behind the, the curtains of the nutrition space online, she was like, this is the most toxic environment I've ever seen. I've never seen this level of hate. People make stitch videos about you. They talk shit about you. They say gnarly things like, you know, Lane famously, like every time he makes a video about Dave Asprey, it's like Dave Asprey. And he like calls people names. Like he's a third grader, <laughs> you know, and you're looking at the thing, but the, the piece about, I, I think this comes with, you know, significant personal development and getting to a place where you kind of understand how things work and what's really at the core, the fragility of that, you know, but it's all perceived authority because I'm looking at like, if someone like someone has a PhD and they point at me and they say misinformation and it's misinformation because I said so, and here's study X, Y, Z, blah, 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 blah. I look at it and I'm like, listen, man, we're playing a different game. There is a perception of authority that you have for the ivory tower, universities, schools, whatever. Like in order for your credentials to matter, you have to believe in the perceived authority from the people who hand you those credentials. I do not. Welcome to subjective reality. I don't believe in your education, period. And we saw this with Huberman Jack Cruz, where like, it's what's water, right? Like these guys, they're trained by the system. And then, you know, Jack Cruz gets Huberman talking about the studies he's doing in his lab and blah, 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 blah. And Jack's just like patiently waiting. And then he's like, yeah, how many of those, you know, tests were done in a sterile environment under fluorescent lights? And you can see Huberman, like, he just like pauses. He's like dead in his tracks. Like, I, I literally never thought of that. I didn't think about this, right? Like a, a sterile lab environment with fluorescent lights above it, that, that is useless to us out in the world. We don't live in a sterile environment, you know? So it's this kind of what's water thing. They don't know that they're like trapped in this system. So if I'm, they're like, hey, misinformation, whatever. I'm like, that's cool, man. Like, have a great time. I hope you're helping people. Awesome. Like, I'm gonna go do my thing and keep helping people. And Megan, my girlfriend again, she, she said it in a, really, in a really funny way. She was like, yeah, it's like somebody coming up to you on the street, like you, Kyle. If someone comes up to you on the street and they're just like, look at you, you dummy with your fucking stupid blue hair. And you're like, <laughs> you're like look, look around, you're like, what? what? Like, uh, are you talking to me? And then like, yeah, your stupid blue hair. And immediately you shift to a place of empathy. You're like, hey, man, are you okay? Like, do you need help? Do I need to call somebody? Because yeah. it, it just doesn't land on you. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's the thing. is like people have a really hard time with subjective reality. Yeah. Well, then there's a lot on them. I'm trying to think of the fucking name of the book. You've probably heard of it. Um, Luke's story turned me on to it. It's called The World or the Most Dangerous Superstition. Yeah, incredible book. Who's that? Larkin Rose? Yeah, I can't remember. Oh, yeah, Larkin Rose. I'll link to this in the show notes. Fantastic, we'll fix it dude. if the title's kind of off. But it, it basically, the entire thing is debunking authority, but not just debunking it. It's showing how it's led to the greatest genocides, the greatest mass murders, the greatest, the, the greatest tragedies in human history yeah. are all built on the foundational piece of authority. Yep. And it's mind blowing. It's something you can't unsee once you see it. Yeah. And and it's very easy now to see it in all the ways things are are have kind of been laid out, right? Even the military militarization of different things. Like we, I knew from friends in fire that there's there's a hierarchy in the fire department that's similar to the military, and that's just mm -hmm. how things go. Um, but corporations are set up that way. Medicine is set up that way, mm -hmm. right? You've got a you've got a, a one person deciding what every doctor in the hospital can do, right? Like that. So, so it's top down and compartmentalized control, you know? So like I think about shit like that, that's all based on authority. And yeah. then the only, like you said, the only thing for, for them to give the same shit with like Egyptologists, mm -hmm. you know, like our Anthony West talking about that, like they've written books. They can't see it new. Exactly. They have books. They have like their yep. thesis paper, their whole last 40 years of their life. Mm. is based on, you know, the, the, it's based on the modern narrative yeah. what everyone's agreed to. They can't see it in a new way. Yeah. And so I get that too. I get like, how could you see, um, how could you see that you've been wrong in any of these things? Then that would just discredit everything you've ever done. And now what's, what are you left with? Right? Yeah. Well, and this is the piece where, where you and I purposefully for many years now have jumped headfirst into ego shattering, ego shattering experiences on purpose. Most people have not, right? So you have this system where like they are tying their beliefs to their identity. I mean, it's, it's one of the biggest problems that we have, right? It's like this, there's an old Bruce Lee quote that I love, uh, absorb what is useful, reject what is useless, add what is uniquely your own. But I even add to that, right? Because there's a subjectiveness to that. It's like absorb what is useful, reject what is useless. Like what is useful to me? What is useful to me may be entirely different from what is useful to you, right? I was explaining to my clients, I'm like, there's, 
there's somebody in the world right now where their best case, most aligned scenario is like they live alone, off the grid, in a tiny house, in the forest, and they knit wool socks all day long. And they are just 10 out of 10 blissed out happy. That's their shit. I would rather die. I don't want to do that. You know, <laughs> are they wrong? No, of course not. And this is the piece with like the subjective reality piece is like what I'm essentially teaching people. And I don't even want to say teaching, right? Like I don't have any answers for you. If you come to me and you say you have a problem and I'm like, all right, man, you want me to help you with this problem? And you're like, yeah. And you now grant me authority to help you with the problem. I am a mirror. You've named me, Justin. It's Kyle talking to Kyle. You're having a unique consciousness experience that can only happen through the lens of communicating with me, a unique mirror. And when you communicate with Paul, it's different. And when you communicate with Monsal, it's different. When you communicate with Aubrey, it's different. This is the whole piece, right? It's God playing with God 8 billion times over, right? So you're coming to learn from me. People are coming to learn from me, but I'm teaching them like it's your job. All you have to do is just create your own reality. And whatever lens you view things through, that's what's going to happen. So like when Lane Norton wakes up in the morning every day. I, I want to pause you there too, yeah. because this is exactly what Robert Anton Wilson was pointing to. Fucking one of the greatest thinkers of all time, phenomenal author. Uh, he wrote Prometheus Rising, which is Eric Skadzi's favorite fucking book. But he mm. talks about that. He doesn't believe in reality. He believes in realities. Yes. And this is what, this is the dots that I connected when I had Peter Crone on the podcast last time was... He was saying that in a different way, but he was mm-hmm. saying the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. And, and in basically, and that people will think words are descriptive. Yes. Words are not descriptive. They're creative. Exactly. Right. And back to Robert Anton Wilson, he doesn't, he doesn't believe in reality. Singularly, he believes in realities and all of us are living each our own unique dream in our own reality tunnel. Mm-hmm. And what you put into that reality tunnel is mirrored back to you mm. within reason, right? Nobody's like, fucking, I can fly. I'm a part of that. Sure reality tunnel, that'd be cool, right? Totally, There's some yeah. certain laws we abide by. But that's, I want, that's a very big point you just made. So yeah, we can go even further that. with that, man. So the, the cabin experience I told you about before we started, we can dig into that if you want to, but that I was seeing repeating patterns in self that I was not okay with. And I said, I need to break the reality tunnel. That's how I view all personal development. Like if I'm unhappy with something, if there's a patterned experience happening, I need to break that reality tunnel and create a new reality, Right. And we can play that out as far as you want to, right? The thing of like, well, we can't fly. Can we? Once upon a time, we couldn't fly. <laughs> yeah, and I've then the dream- fucking Wright brothers came along. I've had dreams where I unlocked the ability to fly. And yeah. not, not with a fucking uh, a technology, just with my own, with my, with my physical instrument, the, the meat suit. Totally. Yeah. Like, and I mean, a voice came through amazing. from the sky that said, you like it better when there are rules to play with. And I was like, holy shit. And I woke up, I was like, all right, heard. Dude, <laughs> okay, don't exactly. Try to unlock that. <laughs> exactly. Right. And this is the thing of like, there's one of my favorite books of all time. I, you and Godzi both would probably love this. Um, Austin Floyd turned me on to this. It's called The Crack in the Cosmic Egg. I haven't heard of it. Dude. I mean, you need to read this after this conversation. Who's the author? Oh, I can't remember. We got we to find it and okay. maybe put it in the show notes. We'll get in the can. show notes for sure. Jose will do it. Cracking the Cosmic Egg is basically explaining that every single generation of human thinks they are discovering the truth. And that is nonsense, right? It's like this idea, if, if I take my aura ring and I drop it, look at that, it fell down. Gravity is real. Gravity is a descriptive term that we're using to desperately try to make sense of phenomenon that can't be made sense of. And this is the place, the place of enlightenment. One of, oh my God, you're, I haven't met Paul yet. He's fucking amazing. But he had this, this video the other day where he was just saying like, most Texture. people, yeah, yeah, Paul J. He's like, most people don't realize that they are not enlightened enough to actually understand the religious texts that they are living by and choosing to believe in. <laughs> and it's that, right? It's this thing of like, did Einstein discover E equals MC squared? Did he discover any of the things that he discovered? Or did he put it into reality and reality bent to meet that? Right? In the 1970s or whatever on Star Trek TV show, everyone has these devices and they're moving things around in the screen with their fingers. And then here we are later and everyone's got an iPad and a phone and their thing, right? It's like, is an, is, is an iPhone the truth? Did we discover the truth? Every generation thinks that their truth is the fucking truth because they're so much smarter than the last ones, which is why there are theoretical physicists right now making up math that can't currently be solved that would allow matter to move faster than the speed of light. Because right now we are trapped and constrained by the discovery of the speed of light and that nothing can move faster than the speed of light, right? What is math? Where did math come from? Math is the truth. Okay, cool. Did a human invent it? Did they do this? What is an inch? An inch. Okay, we've decided. that. Well, it's, it's a unit of measurement. An inch is real. Look, the edge of this carpet is one inch. Is it? 
<laughs> you know, and you get into this whole place where it's just like understanding that people are desperately trying to figure out reality. And usually it changes. It's constantly flowing over time. Sky King and I just talked about this where it's like learning is not static. It's always moving. The systems are always moving and changing and we have to be willing to grow. And this is why you have the old quote that people say like, you know, um, things change when scientists start to die off. It's because they're so locked in their way and their identity is tied to this thing instead of like the joyful experience of just like being incredibly open-minded. Like you go to NASA's website right now and it's like, yeah, 95% of everything, we have no fucking idea what it is. It's dark matter or whatever it is. Like we don't know. It's the only smart thing Neil deGrasse Tyson has said. Yeah, it's crazy, right? So it's like, okay, for our, everyone is like, well, the math, math and the science. And it's like, well, for the math to work, we have to reject 95% of everything. Then our calculations work. Perfect. They're perfect calculation. You know what I mean? And it's like, and I'm not, of course, like there's been, we're, we have this camera here. We have these headphones, like so much technological advancement from horse and buggy carriages. Like it's amazing. I love science. It's fantastic. Like I think it's great, but it's still humans desperately trying to put reality into a box and label it. This is the truth. We all know 50 years from now, we're going to be looking back on shit we were doing today. Like what a bunch of dummies. How could they possibly think that that was the right thing to do? This never changes. Putting a cell phone to your ear. Exactly. Who would do that? <laughs> right. A hundred percent. And it's like, there are people out there right now. Like I remember like Rob Wolf did a video about this. He's like, you gotta be crazy to think that like your cell phone's going to damage, going to get through your skull and damage you. And I'm like, I don't know, man. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Yeah. Listen to Doc, Dr. Jack Cruz. Exactly. You know? you know? Yeah. I'm thinking about putting an EMF canopy around my bed. I'm like, I'm gonna, I think that's a good idea, you know? But, but why not? You know, you're in this situation where like the, the more you get just like bullheaded, my truth is the truth. You're going to run into trouble. And that's the crazy thing about credentials and, you know, mainstream medicine being the third leading cause of death and all this stuff. And when I, when I talk to people about personal authority, people always come to me and they're just like, oh, like I tried keto and it worked really well. And I'm like, okay, you're a hundred pounds overweight right now. They're like, yeah, I lost 30 pounds on keto. And then like I gained it all back and then some, but the diet worked really well. I'm like, the diet worked so well, you had to stop following it. Like amazing. Like the, then it's not correct. Like you can't, if it's not sustainable, you're in big trouble. Like the, the fundamental thing that I'm teaching, which is so funny when people throw the term like misinformation around online or say that things are dangerous. I'm like, eat whole foods as they exist in nature. Eat when you're hungry until you're not hungry anymore. Get sunshine every day. Go for walks. Try to sleep eight hours. You'll be a healthy person. That's it. Yeah, those are some pretty important foundational pieces. Not yeah. misinformation, by yeah. the way. And super dangerous. <laughs> it's, you it's know? cutting edge. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Jamie Wheel did a, if it, uh, oh, I'll link to this. If people don't, I think it's Flow Genome Project dot com. You can sign up for his newsletter. I love. I mean, I love Jamie, but his newsletters are fucking awesome. And he's talking to the New Year's resolution one's great because he's like, "We're what, what are you going to recycle this year as the new hotness?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Two yeah. years ago, I was like, "Oh yeah, that's so 2020." You know, it was just so it's such a fucking such great humor. And then he basically lists what you just listed. This shit has always worked and will always work. 100%. You know, don't have yeah. caffeine afternoon if you yeah. can, right? Yeah. Reduce yeah. that, you know? Have, totally. Wait at least 90 minutes before you consume caffeine. That's something I've just reintroduced in the last week. Yeah, And yeah. feel way better from it. It's like, yeah, oh, man. yeah, I just got in the habit of rolling out of bed and having coffee. Yeah. Whereas if I hit the juve light or fucking drink water, I'm naturally going to rise. And then the caffeine's still going to work. Totally. When I decide to have it, you know? Um, there's, there's so much in there that I, that I, that I appreciate. But the misinformation piece is funny because it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's a coin that's been termed similar to conspiracy theory. Yes. You know, brought to you by the CIA, mm-hmm. you know, right around JFK's assassination. Yeah. And then still used today at, at alarming rates to point to anything that doesn't go with the mainstream. It's weaponized. Yeah. Yeah. It's weapon. And, and, and I mean, it's brilliant. Again, it's brilliant propaganda. The propaganda machine is insane. Right. And that's the thing is like when you get to this place of, You have, what people are doing is they're discounting their own personal experience because of their belief in authority, you know? And that's really the, the, my biggest problem that I have with calories in, calories out is like, they take credit for all health benefits. And when you don't get health benefits, it's your fault because the math is perfect. You know? Well, I want to ask you, you know, I did a ketogenic diet right, right in 2014 is when I retired from fighting. And I had, I think, Tim Ferriss had Dr. Dom Agostino on. He had Dr. Peter Atia on. This is early in Pete's days. He was, people knew who the fuck he was in mm-hmm. medicine, but he was really blowing up from a podcast since then. And before he came out with his own podcast, The Drive, and I think before he went on Rogan's. Um, those two podcasts really drove me into wanting to try a ketogenic diet. And, mm-hmm. I, and, I, and I say it worked for me 
because it allowed my brain to heal in conjunction with fucking hyperbaric oxygen, mm -hmm. float tanks, meditation, and plant medicines. So mm -hmm. it's not like I did a fucking just a solo deep dive on this. Right. But I felt my brain working in ways that I had never experienced even throughout college. Mm. And, and it wasn't for weight loss. It was for energy. It was for my ability to say no to food and not be, you know, trapped on the carb cycle and things like that. Mm -hmm. Long term, I never believed this was something that people should do forever, even mm -hmm. modified versions of it for that matter. You know, mm -hmm. guys like Louis Villasenor, um, Keto Gains, you mm -hmm. know, he's got some pretty cool info on how you'd stay on that with glycogen, you know, pre-workout and different things like that. Mm -hmm. I like food too much to fucking want to stay in one lane or another. And it appears to me, you know, if we, if we really think ancestrally, uh, nobody other than the Inuit was eating 80% fat, 10% protein, 10% carbohydrates. The no. Nutritional ketosis doesn't exist on the planet. Mm -hmm. What does exist is periods without, mm -hmm. right? If, you, if you're north, you have a certain uh, part, you know, you, you get away from the equator a certain amount towards the poles and, and Weston A. Price dove into this. Paul Check really broke down Weston A. Price's work so, so very well. Odds are wintertime came with less carbohydrates or the things that you could store. And when those ran out, then you might've been in ketosis for two or three weeks or a month. Mm -hmm. There might've been a point where the, the tribe ran out of food and you had to go on a long hunt and you didn't come back, you know, for 10 days without food for everyone. Mm -hmm. Those seem that, you know, the acute stressor of a fast and things like that and understanding how you can reset the optimization of the mitochondria and, and you know, um, Jack Cruz goes into, you know, the leptin RX where you're going to eat like a bolus of protein within 30 minutes of waking and that mm -hmm. starts to reset things and, and, and uh, you get the process of gluconeogenesis coming back on to ramp up the mitochondria. There's different ways up, this, up the mountain. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on, on things like ketogenic diets, fasting, intermittent fasting, and, and the different diet types that you would say no to long-term chronically, but yes to in the acute? Yeah, I mean, for me, I like to see people get to what is actually a balanced diet, right? So this would be, I mean, you could call it 30, 30, 30, right? Like 30% of your calories from fat, 30% of your calories from protein, 30% from carbs. You could try something like that or go to 20% protein and 40% carbs or whatever. Like it's, it's going to be somewhere close to balanced for me in an, in an ideal situation. But the ketogenic diet is an interesting one. I was similar to you when I first did keto and I learned about metabolic flexibility I was like, I got to do this, right? So I stayed in nutritional ketosis by daily blood draw every single day for 12 weeks straight. And I did Mark Sisson's aerobic threshold training, Phil Maffetone. Cool. So this, this was after the keto reset diet? Yeah, this was... Because um, that keto reset diet was... A, he had many pieces where Sisson laid out things that were went counterintuitive to what mm -hmm. we knew about ketogenic diets before. Like yeah. don't do high intensity intervals. If you fall off the wagon, walk for four hours. Yeah, like go low and slow. And when he started breaking down, you know, the reason you want to do high intensity intervals, even though you won't show blood ketones for a day, is because you're going to dump all your glycogen stores and then your body will ramp back up much higher levels of natural ketone production mm -hmm. because of that. Up until that point, people didn't think that way because if you worked out with high intensity, your blood would show no ketones in it for a while. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you, your body had effectively used it. You know? Yeah, yeah, I did this once. Uh, I did like a five-day water fast just to show my followers online and I was doing jujitsu and CrossFit at the time. So I was doing two-a-days training and I would show them, like I'd go into jujitsu at like 65, 70 blood sugar and come out at like 130. I'm like, where did these carbs come from? You know, just show them how the system works. Because ultimately that the body is just an incredible adaptation machine. It's going to work with what you give it, period. You know, and same with poison. It's like I would argue when you first went keto or whatever, um, Joe Hawley is a great example of this. When I talked to him about like the diet of NFL players, he's in the NFL for nine years. He's like, dude, it's trash. They're just like feeding you trash. It's just like pasta and bread and pizza and like just as many calories as you can. I remember right? the feeding table at ASU. So Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. I've worked with a lot of um, ex D1 college football players who are 30 years old and they're like 400 pounds because they kept their eating habits the same and didn't do like the crazy training or whatever. But so anyway, long story short, I told you I was in the music industry for 15 years. I had no intention of being a health and wellness guy. I had, my niece was born about nine years ago, terminally disabled. So she was having over 300 seizures a day. And within seven days of, of life, she's in the pediatric ICU. And now like my whole family, like we live in the pediatric ICU at this point. She's hooked up to all these machines. The pictures are crazy. I could show you this stuff. She's in there for months. And I mean, within a couple of weeks, it's like, this child is going to die with 100% certainty. Like the life expectancy for what she ended up having, it's called KC, KCNQ2. It's like a protein problem in the potassium channel of the brain. So she was one of 96 living cases in the world when we went through this. But in the beginning, they didn't know what it was. 
it's like, is this epilepsy? But it's like grand mal seizures and birth suppression seizures where like she literally has this big spike and this seizure and then flat lines, like she's dead. She would like turn purple and then she'd come back and start crying like fucking gnarly dude. Craziest thing I've ever been through. And you know, my brother and his wife were like put on antidepressants and like, it's just crazy to watch this whole system work. But in the beginning, they're like, maybe this is epilepsy. So I was in Nashville at the time, still in, heavy in my music career. And we were at like Vanderbilt Neurology and Centennial Hospital. And then there's a, an organization called the Charlie Foundation, spelled just like the name Charlie. Um, and they specialize in ketogenic diets for epileptic children, teenagers, toddlers, whatever. We were we talked to the Cleveland Clinic and the Ronald McDonald House. And like, I just got intro in this whole world of like sick care for little children. And it's kind of a death sentence when they're like, hey, the, the child can't eat or drink. And we have to install a G-tube, which is a tube that goes straight near their stomach. And then they feed them with formula through the tube. So they put her on this G-tube, which was this big emotional experience for my family and I. And um, they put her on the G-tube. And this is where mainstream medicine, like they don't think about quality. So they're like, we know the ketogenic diet is high fat, low carb. So they give all these babies in the pediatric ICU with seizure disorders. Uh, I think Gerber makes it. Yeah. It's called Keto Cal. It's a ketogenic baby formula. This is where everything that I do now came from. Mm. is they're feeding her this baby formula multiple times a day and I just picked up the bottle and looked at it. And the ingredients, high fat, low carb, soybean oil, sunflower oil, artificial sweeteners, like why? It's not even ta- it's not even touching taste buds. You have artificial sweeteners in there and then like the fats that you're giving are all like polyunsaturated fats that are like processed with hexane and all this bullshit. Like this is toxic sludge going in the body of a week's old baby. And I brought this to the attention of a neurologist he looks at the bottle. I kid you not, like out of a fucking movie, bro. He looks at me and he goes, huh, I never thought to check that. And that was it. That's how we got here. I was like, this is a joke. There are no adults in the room. This is a game we're playing. Like what has had, this guy doesn't even know what he's putting in this child's thing. It's just perceived authority. This is the one that our tax dollars subsidize that's on the shelf. That is the treatment for seizures. We put this in the baby's body with no thought to it. Do you remember when I gave you a bottle of superfood powder? Mm -hmm. That is a spinoff of a baby formula that I made for my niece in my kitchen after that moment. I went home, I studied paleo superfoods, I got food dehydrators, food processors, and I started blending paleo superfoods and my dad and I were like taste testing them. It was like liver and all this other shit and it was gnarly at first. And eventually I created this formula and I got it cleared by the neurologist to feed it to my niece in her G tube because it was better than keto cow. And then I had just read the four hour work week. I was having, I just done ayahuasca, this whole crisis all, I got drop kicked by the universe all at the right time. And, um, yeah, so I just added a bunch of uh, beef and salmon collagen to the formula and started selling it to CrossFitters. And that was my first supplement that I launched on Amazon. And then from there I started a podcast. People started asking me questions. I just did like, ask me anything podcast. And it was like my friends on Facebook. And then here we are now, you know, eight years later or whatever. That's but a fucking hell of an origin story. That was how I learned about keto. So now I'm out here in this world of keto and watching everyone do keto and everything. But what's crazy, we have studies now where you can take like the benefits of a keto diet and essentially just remove endotoxin from the gut, something called lipopolysaccharide, and get the same benefits of a keto diet without restricting carbohydrates. It's the same way like when you hear a caloric restriction for longevity where it's like actually you can just restrict methionine. Is this similar to like new the new carnivore via Saladino where he's getting... Raw milk, fruits, and honey. Yeah, yeah, totally. But he's eliminating all other other toxins, right? Exactly. You remove okay. the toxins and remove the plant matters that can lead to bacterial growth in the gut or the that formation would be like of FODMAP food and things of that exactly. nature. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fibers. Okay. Yep. So that's basically like what Clovis is. So when people first come to Clovis, we play the macros game. I'll write a fitness plan for you. I'll do the whole thing. But I have one. I have a thermal metabolic approved foods list, which is like these are foods that I have hand selected to be the most nutrient dense with the least problematic plant toxins that are going to light your metabolism on fire. Like I'm five foot nine, I weigh 170 pounds. I try to never eat less than 2,800 calories a day. I'm often well over 3,000 calories a day. People are like, what? It's like, because it seems like so much food. You know, so I'm literally just teaching people if you put the right things into the body, you can change everything. And it's like this whole idea that like keto is what's making people better or low carb or vegan or whatever it is. It's like most people, I was born in 86, 37 years old. My whole childhood, was like fucking Dunkaroos and Pop Tarts and Cinnamon Toast Crunch and Doritos and Coca Cola, right? What was those hot ones that you could do your own little frosting on? They came out after Pop Tarts. Yeah, yeah, the strudels, the yeah, toaster strudels. Toaster strudels. I used to love toaster oh, strudels, God, bro. Those were good. You know, my dad used to make me breakfast when I was a kid, <laughs> and it was just like, 
white bread, toasted, country crock, margarine, and cinnamon and sugar. <laughs> uh. <laughs> you know, it's like, so we grew up in this toxic processed food environment. And then guys like you and I were like curious and started looking at, oh, I'm going to try this keto thing. Wow. Turns out I feel great, you know, but it's the same thing with acute stressors. I, I do think a lot of people, especially like hard driving people like us, like I own three companies, you know what I mean? It's like, and I'm trying to stay fit and eat and all the, do all the things to some degree, like many of us get addicted to stress hormones. <laughs> you know, it's like a cold plunge spikes the shit out of your stress hormones. Catecholamines, phew, off the charts. People are like, I feel like I drank five shots of espresso. I'm like, that's your body in a stress state telling you to go get food because you just put it through something unbelievably intense and it needs energy. Yeah, you put it in a state where it could die. Exactly. I thought that's something that I've always looked at. It's, it's funny because when I was fighting, you know, I was like, you have this scale Will the cold work at 60 degrees if you stay for an hour? Absolutely. Will it work mm-hmm. at 32 degrees for one or two minutes? Absolutely. Yeah. Do you want to spend an hour in there or one or two minutes? You know, and I always <laughs> leaned into the high intensity in yeah. the shortest duration. And uh, knowing, you know, how, how fragile the nervous system is, especially when we move into our 30s and then 40s. Now I'm mm-hmm. 41. It's like, I'm not going to do an hour at 60 but I'm probably not going, I probably don't need to go underneath 40 degrees again. Yeah. There's yeah. fucking no reason for that because I'm going to get such good benefit. And even like, uh, we had a Josh Church on who did the edge theory, uh, cold, cold plunges out of, out of San Diego. Awesome dude, Wim Hof specialist and, and geeks out on all this stuff and saying all the science on cold is at 57 degrees. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like that's fucking bananas. Totally. No one knows that. You yeah. know, it's, it, just engage, engage the pissing contest of who can go coldest. Like a hundred percent below thirty two. We just cracked the ice and sat next to it. You yeah, know? it's like like no, there's it's not better. It's no, not no. better. I noticed that with uh, Huberman was when Huberman was on Rogan one of these recent times, and he's like, "What's your cold plunge at?" And Huberman was like, "Yeah, it's at like fifty one or fifty two. And like Rogan's essentially calling him a bitch to his face. <laughs> he's just like, "What, bro? You gotta try it. I'm doing this thing." And it's just like, okay, is this for actual health benefit yeah. or is this like an ego stroking contest? You know? Yeah. And that's where you try to figure out like. What actually has benefit? And again, all the way back full circle to personal authority, right? If you're doing the crash dieting of when you want to lose weight, you start eating 1,200 calories and doing an hour of chronic cardio and lifting weights five days a week, the New Year's resolution style, and then you feel like dog shit four weeks in and you like go binge on Pizza Hut or whatever. It's like, did that feel good to you? It doesn't seem like that felt good to you, you know? So that's all I'm trying to do is like help people see that like the focus is always on more fat burning, more stress, engaging stressful pathways. Keto, Dom D'Agostino did a great um, episode on the Eat Lean, Eat Clean, Get Lean podcast with Jay Feldman. I don't know if you've come across Jay Feldman, but no, I'll intro you link to it. He's amazing, dude. Uh, unbelievable. And Jay did a debate with Dom D'Agostino on like bioenergetics versus keto. By the end of that, Dom D'Agostino was literally like, yeah, I've actually never claimed that keto is good for anybody long term and I don't think people should do it. Because Jay is just hammering him, hammering, hammering him. It's like, this is an inherently stressful state. This is a backup energy pathway that is inherently stressful. You, we know that your stress hormones spike in this thing. And he's like, yeah, totally. You know, and it's like, wait, when he, when he was on Ferris and all this thing, every, and he's out here like, I'm doing keto and deadlifting 500 pounds for reps. And everyone's like looking at that as like, it's a goal or something. Like, I'm really trying to help people see that like obesity is an adaptation to stress. And, in, and inflammation, right? Like I'm sure you um, have dug into probably like Chris Christopherson and like cancer as a metabolic disease and all yeah, this stuff, right? It's phenomenal. like cancer is not a root cause of anything. Cancer is a symptom. It's a metabolic adaptation. There is a problem here in the machinery and we now have this symptom that develops. You can take a cancerous cell and switch it back to being a non-cancerous cell. That's possible to do. You don't have to cut it out and use radiation and all this shit, right? So obesity is the same thing because of the social stigma around like, well, you're fat, you're undesirable and you're lazy and all these things like just like cr- defeating, crushing people's souls. When what is happening is there is a root cause that's happening inside of them. The storage of body fat, the, the fat storage switch being in the on position is an adaptation to a problem. It's a symptom. Obesity is not a root cause of anything. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So it's like, why do we look at it as well, this horrible thing? Well, part of it, part of it too, is that it, the, with what you just said, and in addition to that, this this giving away of authority, yeah, right. Because what does that authority say? The authorities say you're doomed to your genetics. Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. And and not all the epigenetic on off switches we control through lifestyle, which really determine what you look like at the end of the day, yeah. physically and mentally, emotionally, every, everything determines your outcome. If you you know, and it's crazy. I, I thought I was blown away when I first did the genetic test. I out, outsourced the raw data to found my fitness, Dr. Rhonda Patrick's site. Yeah, yeah. She could tell you tell me what, um, what's the damn company's name that I just mentioned? 
Uh, da, 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 what's the big one? 23 and me. Yep. She could tell you what 23 and me used to say before the FDA put a gag order on them and said, you can't make those claims. Yeah. Right. So she'd say like, you know, Forex higher for this type of bloodborne cancer or whatever the thing was. Me, my wife and Aubrey, cause we did it at the same time, all had the highest level predisposition for obesity and type two diabetes. Mm. And I have like a couple things differently than them around Alzheimer's, which is type three diabetes. Yeah. Right. So it's yeah. just like, and it was laughable because I was like, this fucking, this is exactly what they're saying in Western medicine yeah. that I should be this way. You look at the rest of my family, mm-hmm. not my immediate family, but all my relatives. I can see why they'd say that. That is in the genes. Yeah. There's no two ways about it. Yeah. But that will never, that's never going to come to fruition. And it never has to for any of us yeah. because the on off switches actually matter more. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's when we get back to personal, like the personal authority piece of this too. Is I say like it doesn't matter who you decide to like temporarily outsourcing your authority can be a good thing, right? It's I think it's more beneficial to look at it through the lens of like like I said, a mirror. You're talking to you through me and having this unique consciousness experience. But it it should always be as simple as like you signed up for the thing. The person said do this and you did it. Did your life get better? If the answer is no, stop doing the thing. It's the def- I always uh, compare it to like a fly, right? Like we've all seen like a fly just like banging into a window pane. Bang, bang, bang. Six inches to the right is like a wide open window. <laughs> and the fly is just ding, 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 just getting it, you know? And that's really the thing is like I'm trying to help people see like you should be able to feel into it. It's like the, the concept of intuitive eating. It's like that's ultimately what I'm trying to get everyone to is intuitive yeah. eating. But- it's, that's, I think that's a big thing. You know, Eric Godsey and I are trying to reconnect people to their intuition. Yeah, Which exactly. never marketed that way. Right. But that's it. Like, you can't market it that yeah, way. You, you, you know? Because it just seems unattainable. It seems woo woo. It seems yeah. too fucking out there. But at the end of the day, that's what's going to give you discernment. That's when it's going to give you your sovereignty. That's what's going to grant you, you know, to the ability to hold the steering wheel and take control back yeah. through responsibility and, and making decisions for yourself. Uh, and that comes with practice, right? So it is good. Like I, I've learned from so many people where granted my authority to different people to learn from them and, and taken what's worked, you know, and done the same thing that you guys are doing. Uh, Clovis, which is phenomenal, but all in the guise of, you don't need to stay with me forever. We want you to, you know, we want to f- put your big boy pants on and let you go out and be an adult now. A, a good coach should always want you to not want them after, to, to, to not need them after a certain period of time. Like all the programs I do, if somebody comes and does like intensive one-on-one coaching with me or even like group coaching, it's a 90-day program. At the end of 90 days, we're going to sit down and we're going to have like a wrap session. Like, how do you feel? Do you need, do you have more things that you want to work on? Like in that 90 days, I can teach you health and wellness is very, 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 very simple. Very simple. But it's always going to be a matter of consistency over time. That's probably the one piece. If I can try to find something that I agree with these mainstream guys on, it's like consistency over time. It's like, what's the sustainable thing? That's what uh, uh, Shervin, uh, the, the founder of Symbiotic, yeah, said yeah, yeah. differently. He said momentum. Yeah. Momentum is the thing that gets you get back on the wagon once you fall off. Momentum is the thing. It's the, it's the inertia that you've generated from consistency yep. that carries you through the rough spots. Yeah. And does the consistency, like where the rough spots, let's say, right? Like does the consistency make you feel good? You know, because that's the thing. And this is the New Year's resolution. Everyone laughs that by like February 1st, everyone's health and wellness goals are out the window because they go so hard and they're, they're super sore and they're tired and they're hungry and they're starving. They're trying to do everything all at once. They feel miserable. Like you, you really can't sustain something that makes you feel miserable long term. You know, and even if it's good for you, from, like I, I've been, yeah. the last, in the last three years, two years ago, I, I changed my resolution to being a better athlete. Hmm. And because I knew what that meant, it meant lifting less, doing more martial arts, and even doing less martial arts in a certain degree, right? Like I can't mm. do jujitsu three days a week with roles. I could go, tr- I can coach every night, I can get on the mat and, and drill every night, but I can't compete at a high level every mm. night. That just fucks me up. I can't lift heavy more than twice a week if I'm going to do all these other things either. Yeah, you know, and if I'm including, you know, a chill run and a hard work run, like some sprint work, and I'm including boxing and kickboxing, it's probably going to mean that I do one of each of these things per week. Yeah. Right? So I have four or five workouts, but they're all separate from one another. And, yeah. You know, anybody who's trying to get their black belt, they'd say, like, you have to train more than once a week. But yeah. I got that. You know, yeah. I'm just trying to maintain what I have yeah. and be a better athlete. Um, so, yeah, in some ways, that's the refining part of it, right? Like, where are you at now? How do your goals change? What does that look like? But it's the thing that I had last year was I wanted to do mobility every day mm. and I made it and I only had to do 16 minutes. I got a little, little Kelly Sturette routine that I do super yeah, couch yeah. stretch, two minute squat, and then some bands for the upper body. 
I made it like three months in before I dropped a couple of days. And I made it six months in with only, I, I can count on one hand how many days I missed. Yeah. Second half of the year, fucking all bets were off, yeah. right? Yeah, I yeah, was yeah. happy if I did it twice a week. <laughs> but the thing that I love about it is the goal, like you make a goal, you want it to be low hanging enough that it's something you can grab at every day. Mm -hmm. I always felt better if I did it. Yeah. No matter if it was the last thing I did before bed or first thing in the morning, I always felt better if I did it. And that's what's attractive about it. That's what made it consistent. And that's why even though I didn't do it 365 days a year, I still, can, I still count it as a massive win. Yeah. And my body is far more mobile because of that even yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's like, what's the lead domino, right? Like that, the mobility practice definitely is helping you in your, the goal that you've set up. Like, I want to be a better athlete, you know? And that's, it, when we talk about psychedelics or anything, right? It's like, if, if I, if every single thing I do in my life is only looked at through the lens of, is this the best option for my metabolic health? I'm going to miss out on a tremendous amount of cool shit that I can do <laughs> that is really good for my personal development. Like if I go do a dry fast plus psychedelics or something like that, like that's not great for my metabolism. That's a very stressful situation I put myself through. And it's one of the most profound experiences that I've ever had. What I'm trying to help people see is that right now, all of these other things are being missed out on because of the obstacle of health and wellness. If you have someone that wakes up every day and they hate their body, so like the, the, they get up to pee and they look in the mirror and they're like, fuck me again. <laughs> you know, like that's like, what else can you do? How are you going to have your dream job or your best romantic relationship or become fit for service or do something that's meaningful to you when you have this obstacle there? So at some point, like you could decide my number one focus right now is mobility and only mobility. And you could just do mobility for an hour a day, six days a week for the next six months. And you could set that goal and do that. And other things, you your lifts might get weaker or you might not be as good. You'll be rusty and jiu-jitsu when you come back. But if that's a priority that you set for yourself, that's great, man. I'm just trying to help people see that like, if you're suffering tremendously like from type 2 diabetes or you're 200 pounds overweight or something like that, we need a period of time in which your priority is this and yeah. it's got to be this. And if we can look at it through the lens of like, if somebody is drinking 10 Coca-Colas a day, I try to get it to a place where it's like, it's not like, ah, I got this new coach and he's telling me I can't have Coca-Cola, fucking life sucks, restricting all about like this. And instead, like, I know that that's poison and I love myself so much that I would never choose that for myself. Why would I choose that? That works against every single thing that I'm trying to do. But you have to have a high enough self-worth to believe you, you are worthy of health. You know, and that's really the psychological piece that is so problematic in my mind. 88% of adults right now have some form of clinical metabolic dysfunction. 75% of adults are overweight or obese. The entire signal that they are getting from society is you are a lazy piece of shit. How do we get these people up? This is why I start to get in the mirror and say, I love you. Like, let's start with this personal development stuff because you're, you're operating from this place where people are just beating you down. And like, this is your fault and you are a slob and you lack willpower and you lack motivation and discipline. And it's always this restriction thing. You can't have the Coca-Cola, you slob. You know what I mean? It's like, dude, why are we just beating people? Like, it's, it's. Well, that's, if you see the vitriol online, even before we got on, I was talking about a post Tosh made on on prepping for an all women's hunt mm. you know and it was like white texan white supremacist yeah. you know it's <laughs> yeah. like and i knew the guy who said it it's yeah. just like he's an artist so i was like where is that stored in you that yeah. i don't see face to face you yeah. know but that's the, that whatever you see online it's a thousand times worse to themselves in the mirror exactly a thousand bro. times worse. exactly hey, one question i have for you because i do yeah. want to we're at an hour and 19 we, we got about 10 minutes okay i want to have time to give you a tour and hang um Question is, you're open about your plant medicine experiences and how much they've changed your life. It's mm -hmm. one of the ways we connected. Um, and, you know, also with your tenacity, you've done some really cool <laughs> shit, like a dry fast finish by that. Mm -hmm. We have a medicine woman that pours sweat for us here called Waira. Uh, means the wind. She's from Ecuador. And um, they do a similar vision quest where you fast for dry fast and then you finish off with different medicines. But it's four years. It's down in Ecuador. It's on my bucket list. Mm. How much, given the conversation that we've had around self-love and the way we look at ourselves, shifted for you because of that experience? And is that something that, that you know, obviously it's, it's a gray line to be like, I know, I know you're not fucking holding space for clients and shit like that. Yeah. Yeah. But is that a part, is that a useful part of what you're doing with people to get them to crack through? I mean, if we lived in a world where I were able to sit for every single client, 
I think I could move them through what I'm trying to get them to experience 10 times faster easily. It's, it's, I mean, it's exponential, man. I, I honestly, I've been very open about this. Plant medicines, as we call them, psychedelics, whatever you want to call them. Um, I mean, they got to be one of the single most impactful things I have ever done for my personal development and spiritual awakening, if you want to call it that, right? It's like getting to a place of, you know, and I, I think that this word is very loaded and I'm just going to say it. it's like gravity. What is gravity, right? And like to try to get a place, to a place of non-judgment. You know, part of the reason why I am kind of immune to hate online, even though so much hate is thrown at me, is because I don't judge the people that are doing it. Mm. And the cabin experience, I went into purposefully. You, you may be the only podcast I've been on so far where I, I feel like I can actually go here into this piece of it. And I'm just going to go here because I want to be like open and vulnerable about it. Um, I had some repeating patterns that I wasn't thrilled about. And those patterns were around not outright dishonesty or lying, but withholding hiding parts of self from the people that I love, right? And I realized that a lot of that is fear-based. And if I'm hiding parts of self because I'm afraid they're unlovable, then I don't love those parts of myself. So I went into the fasting experience. I got a, a, a cabin was completely by myself. Nobody knew where I was, not even the closest people in my life, just airplane mode, no meditation, no journaling, no reading, no music, no input whatsoever. No brushing your teeth, no water, no food. Brought a bunch of food with me. I had delicious organic fruit laid out everywhere, a refrigerator full of eggs and orange juice and watermelon and everything. And I just had to deal with that every day. <laughs> but I was like, I'm either going to sit in nature and just like observe nature and do like a waking meditation, or I'm going to be in meditation for four days straight with no food, no water. And then breaking that fast with seven grams of psilocybin mushrooms, which is a you know, a hero dose being five grams. Or so it's, it's a big, big, big dose. But I set the intentionality of exploring the darkest parts of self and also understanding that nothing exists, in my opinion, nothing exists outside of my consciousness. So me exploring the darkest parts of self allows me to explore the darkest parts of other and integrate all of that and try to get to this place of non-judgment. So I ended up in this experience. And, and again, everything I'm saying here is completely subjective. Nobody has to take this as truth. It's the experience that I had. Um, I went in and realized that for anything to be God, the way that I believed it to be consciousness, for anything to be God, then everything must be God, right? Like humans, human, like an apple tree, apples. And every single moment of that is spiritual, right? Like me, I've hiked at 15,000 feet in Peru on Wachuma and I've scrolled TikTok in a bathtub. It's the same thing. They're both spirituality. It just is. It's a human humaning. So... It took me, you talked about hell realms. I spent nine hours in hell realms and I went into this. Uh, I had an amazing coach that I worked with. His name is Lion. He's incredible. And um, I wanted it to be a somatic experience. So anything challenging that came up for me, I was just going to move my body and continually move my body and try to not attach story to whatever was coming up. And I mean, dude, I was at one point I was swimming in an ocean of dismembered baby bodies. I was in a cave where humans were strung up to the walls and giant insects were like eating them alive. And I got hit with, I mean, dude, <sighs> war, rape, murder, incest, like the gnarliest shit you can possibly imagine. All of it popped in my head. And like your hell realm, I just had to be like, yeah, there it is. It's all equally as spiritual. It's all part of the human experience. And as long as I judge any of it, I'm going to have problems because good is inherently evil. Evil is inherently good. You can take the gnarliest thing in the world like some war in some distant place that everyone's obsessed about and there's like atrocities happening and everything and there's going to be 501c3s that pop up for that and there's going to be elite special forces guys that go in and save people and the person gets saved and that leads to a documentary film about the story which impacts millions of people to change their lives for the better and they're having charity events and like good always comes from evil evil always comes from good and this is like hermeticism, hermeticism and polarities, right? Like you yeah, get to this place. Doubt. Yeah, exactly, right? And this is the same way Paul Check said, like the people reading religious texts, they're not enlightened enough to understand that text. Where it's like, yeah, you have to get to a place where, I mean, basically you're accepting everything that exists. And on a micro level, everything that exists within itself. Like, what am I doing? So then my, I won't get into this on the podcast, but then like the deepest, darkest parts of myself that I, that I hadn't learned to love at 37 years old, I was 36 at the time. Um, I just went home and I went to my, the love of my life and I was like, hey, I got to share some stuff with you. And she's like, okay. And I shared it all. And she, I started to cry. And she was like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to hurt your feelings here, but is that it? 
<laughs> and I was like, yeah, what do you, what do you mean? Is that it? And she's like, I love you so much. Like, thank you for sharing that with me. And I was like, oh my God. And then I went out the next three days. I'm telling any friend who will listen. I'm just, <laughs> listen, listen to this thing. I've been hiding this since I was like 13 years old. And I want to tell you about this thing. And they're like, wow, man, thanks for sharing that with me. And then many of them are like, bro, me too. I've been dealing with that same thing. And I'm like, what? And they're like, yeah, I haven't told my romantic partner about it either. And I'm like, what? And then they go tell their romantic partner and it's this whole thing. And I'm like, oh my God. And I just got hit with this like, yeah, until you can learn to love every part of yourself, you're going to be in trouble. And that comes with what I think to be the most challenging thing. And, and I also do a lot of work. I do a lot of men's coaching, teaching masculine, feminine polarity. And then I work with couples on communication. I only allow 100% radical honesty in my life. Like if, if we start hanging out more and we are spending time together alone in groups or whatever, I am only interested in the most authentic version of you. I don't want a fake version of Kyle. I want to love you for exactly who you are and anything that you're afraid of or you've never shared with anybody. If you feel comfortable, I want to create a safe container of unconditional safety and unconditional love. Hey buddy, share with me what's going on inside of you so I can show you what it's like to be loved through it. And even if it's something that's a hard no for me going forward, if you're just like doing something that I am not okay with and it, it disrupts our relationship, I could still leave you in unconditional safety and unconditional love. How can I support you in this thing, man? Like if it's a boundary for me, then, you know, I'm not going to let a boundary be violated, but I'm still going to hold you in that place of safety. And I don't believe that you can do that for other until you can do it for self. And that was what that experience was for me. Massive brother. Yeah. Well, that's... I Thank you so much. I appreciate you sharing that, the, the depth of that story. Yeah, man. And uh, especially with the listeners. I think that's the best place to wrap. Where can people <laughs> find you online? Where can people work with you? And yeah, uh, and yeah we'll, we'll get a little tour in. Yeah, so right now, uh, everything is at the Clovis Culture, C L O V I S C U L T U R E. And then the best place to go right now is I always offer free trainings for all this. So I have like one training video that's basically teaching everyone about what I do and the philosophy of health and wellness. And it's just justinalt.com slash free. Go there and you can get the free training. Fuck yeah, we'll link to all that in the show notes. Brother, it's been epic. Thank you. Dude, thank you so much for having me, man. This is such an amazing container that you've created. Thank you, brother. Yeah. <laughs>